Hello, this is Father Louis Skurdy with Friends of the Word. We thank you for joining us on our weekly homily. Today is the third Sunday of Easter, and we're walking with Jesus to Emmaus. Who knows what we'll discover along the way. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to contact me, contact me at fatherlouskurdy at hotmail.com or go to our website, fatherlouskurdyministry.com and join Friends of the Word. Thank you for joining us and pass this on to your family and friends. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them said, Cleopas by name, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there these past days? And he replied to them, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. How our chief priests and the rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. We were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astonished us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported they had seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, How foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us. It is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with them. And it happened that while he was at table with them, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were open, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and how he opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them, who were saying, The Lord has truly been risen. He has appeared to Simon. Then the two accounted what had happened to them on the way, and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles were few but good. The Italians would say, pochi ma buoni. Few but good apostles. Two of them on the way to Emmaus. Now, Emmaus is, like Luke said, seven miles from Jerusalem. But Emmaus had a significant uh, historical place in the lives of the Jews. It was where the ancient times, the Maccabees started the rebellion against uh, Antiochus, Epiphanius, 
and where that whole story of Hanukkah began, when they, they ran into the temple and they, they lit the Hanukkah candles, the, the menorah, and it went on. But the symbol of, of Emmaus was freedom. They were fighting, these were the, the, the Jews who were fighting for their freedom. They were fighting that they be redeemed from the, the yoke of the oppressors. So when you hear that they're walking to Emmaus, and he's questioning to Jesus, one of them, Clopas, questions, we thought Jesus was going to be, and again, he's not saying this, the new redeemer, but the redeemer, once again, you might say. So they had a political idea in mind as to what Jesus was all about in this, this reading from Luke's Gospel. So we have destruction and violence going on. And when we have destruction and violence going on, we usually say, well, that's an absence of God in our lives. Absence of God in, in the incidents. Absence of God in the world. However, we have to work with love and resurrection. The presence of Jesus in our lives. So, you might ask the question of ourselves, if this is what we have to work with, how do we live the resurrected Christ? How do we live Easter? I mean, that happened 2,000 years ago, approximately. But as the story of Emmaus shows us, he is. He, he's alive. He was with them on the road. He had already appeared to Simon. And, and a few other appearance narratives we have in the scriptures. There's a phrase in Italian, and you know me, I have to say something in Italian every week. Se non... I viso per una settimana la tua vita comincia a perdere significato. If you don't have a smile on your face at least once a week, life starts losing its meaning. Optimism. And sarcastically, years ago, I had a nun working for me uh, at, at the university, and uh, she, she nicknamed me the, the eternal optimist. Yeah. Everything happens, and you'll take care of it. We put it together, whatever it is. The eternal optimist. She, took, she, she, she thought it was sarcasm. I thought it was a compliment, actually. And I think all of us are called to be, in a sense, eternal optimists. And, and, and optimist because the word eternal is important. It's, it's Jesus. He, he's, he's the journey of our lives. And, and there's a reason for optimism. Amongst destruction and, and loss... We have life and resurrection. So there's a reason for us to have a, not a giggle, but a smile on our faces as we go through this journey. And, and Peter refers to that journey. We're so journeying. We're going through life. And, and he compares it to the Jews going through the journey in, in the desert. In a sense, they were aimless. They didn't have a directory. They didn't have a GPS. They didn't have a Google account. So they had no idea where they were going. They're just following faith and following Moses. And they're going to the journey and the, and the water they needed and the bread they needed and the quail they needed. All that happened. But they were lost. And, and Peter, in a sense, is saying, you don't go on a journey that has no direction. We're on a journey that has direction. Because the direction of our journey is Jesus, is the eternal kingdom. They were going to, for the, the, the new land, the, the, the promised land. Hey, we've got the promised person, Jesus. And as we're on our journey of life, I think we have to keep Peter and the, and the Emmaus journey, uh, the disciples, in, in mind. Because our goal is not to be lost. We're not aimless. And as Peter very beautifully says, I mean, he talks about God always having been, been the righteous one, always living with, with God forever from all times. But the God up there is now here. The, the, the God in the heavens that, that, the, that the Jews prayed for, to, and, and on top of Sinai, and, and the Elohim, and, and all the manifestations of God. We, we have them in the flesh. That's the whole purpose of the story of Emmaus. We have him in the fight. Doesn't look like what you think Jesus looks like, because his best friends would have known him. But we have Jesus. He is the, the presence of our journey, and he's the destination of our journey. And, as Peter says, he paid for that, that, that freedom to appeal to us and have us appeal to him. He paid for it at a heavy price, his blood. He paid the way. You know, you go through the tolls, and sometimes you have the easy pass, you don't pay, you keep going, and God forbid you, you don't pay the easy toll, they get a little letter in the mail, dear so-and-so, you owe the governor a few bucks. 
But Jesus paid the way for us to go through the tolls of life, for us to sojourn and, and have a direction. He already established it. He gave us the mode, absolutely. Feeding the hungry. Fighting for justice. Fighting for the end of slavery. And human bondage. And trafficking. He, he gives us the mode every day. You want, you want to find out what Jesus gave us as the mode of, of, of sojourning on li- in life with him? Open up the newspaper. Turn on your Google account. Turn on your, your MSN accounts. Find out what's going on there. And all of those reasons are our reasons to fight for justice and bring Christ into the world. Sometimes, depends on salute that they put something positive there. Sometimes they, 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 they give you a heartwarming story in the news. But most of the news is often, as we said, destruction and absence of God. But we have the presence of God. We have Jesus. Not we had Jesus. We have Jesus with us. He's the direction. And just for our sake, Peter, in this, the, 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 this, the story today in the first reading, Peter is taking place in Pentecost. So that's 50 days after the actual event of Easter. And what he does, it gives us, the, is the foundation, and we often hear the reminiscence of those words in the Apostles' Creed. The reminiscences are the kerygma. Fancy word. It's the basic teachings of our faith. And, and, and he spelled it out. Jesus was sent by God. Okay. Jesus was God. Sent by God in the flesh. He was empowered by God to accomplish redemption, salvation, healing, eternal life. Okay. He was betrayed and handed over to crucifixion. Not so happy an event, but all as part of the plan of God. And God raised him up and exalted him into his present state, the resurrection and the exaltation of Christ to the right hand of the Father, equal with the Father. That's the person who came to us in history, who was with us before history began, before time was counted, is with us and remains with us on our journey. Not just a nice philosopher, not just a a, a, a great prophet, but the Son of God in the flesh, who is with us as our companion. Clopas and his friend, could have been his wife, we don't know who the other person was, was another disciple, invite Jesus in. They don't realize, as you heard, that it's Jesus who's enlightening them, who's giving them understanding, who's filling them with the Holy Spirit. They don't understand it yet, but it's interesting, because later on they say, weren't our hearts burning with us? I mean, gee, there was something he was touching in us, but we couldn't quite grasp it. Well, now we have it. We have the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But they, they, they invite him in to the table as companions, companies with bread. And there, in the breaking of the bread... Their eyes, their heart, their souls recognize Jesus. And he's gone. He disappears. That's the Christ who's with us still. And that's the Christ who comes to us when we are companions to one another. Companion. Coming together with bread. Very simple word, but you know what it means if you're there. If you have a companion along the road, if you have a companion in life, if you have a companion to the journey, whatever journey it is, if you have your companion when you're going off to college, if you have a companion during your spring break, things are a little more lifelike. Well, we have a companion with us no matter where we go, and that's Jesus Christ. And the energy to have our eyes and faith open comes to us in the Eucharist, the breaking of the bread. Eventually, the early church calls when they gathered together and, and they told the stories of Jesus and they told the stories of the Old Testament and they broke bread. That was the Eucharist. That was the early coming together. That was the early Mass. Companions with one another. 
how important it is, even this, as we continue the tradition that has now become the Mass, the source and summit of our faith, as we continue this, we recognize him in the breaking of the bread, but the key, just look at Clopas and the other disciple. They ran and went back and started proclaiming their faith. That's the key of the coming together of us and Christ as companions. That's the key of the breaking of the bread, that we are nourished and nurtured and we go out and we live it and we fight for rights and we fight for justice and we let people know where we stand and the sensitivity of the poor with the sensitivity of the migrant. We let people know that we are real and that we live and that we share companion, Christ, our best friend. He's told us, you want to see me? Give drink to the thirsty, feed the hungry, clothe the naked. It would be great to see Jesus whatever he looked like. I often think Jesus probably was not very good looking. He was probably a little dumpy, heavy set guy, maybe hair, maybe no hair. But, right? Because, I mean, he didn't attract people because of his looks. He attracted people because of his message. So I, almost like, like Luke Costello. We can say, oh, he, could you imagine if Jesus looked like, what did he look like on the cross? Boba de Jesu. But could you imagine? Because our goal is not to get caught up into what he physically looked like, because look around to your right, to your left, and stare here. We're all ugly, in a sense. Maybe we're all beautiful, too, in a sense. But God is inviting us to really see one another as companions. And that's so significant that the disciples didn't recognize him. And then he disappears. The action is what he wants to leave us with. The action of coming together as companions, the action of breaking bread, the action of going and evangelizing. Recently, there's, there's a lot of troubled places throughout the world. The, in, in Central Africa, Republic of Central Africa, there, there's riots and religious wars brewing there too. And interesting, the Catholic bishop of that diocese in which the Republic of Central Af Africa falls, invited the head of the Muslim church, the Muslim community, into his house for safety. He opened his door, I, 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 wanna, I hesitate using the word, to the enemy. He opened his door to a brother who was in need. You know, sometimes the Muslims are persecuted by the Christians as well. I mean, that goes back into antiquity, it goes back into other areas of Africa. We know that. And what we are looking at is Christ being our companion, whether we are African or Muslim or, or Catholic or atheist or white or black. Christ is asking us to regard one another as companions in this beautiful story of Emmaus, the, the town of freedom, the town of redemption. In a sense, you know, you ever think of Jesus, what would it be like if he came back as our star of um, a current series on TV, Undercover Boss? Imagine if Jesus comes by disguised, and what, do, what would he do? Like the story of the young Undercover Boss, he comes back to see what's going on, to see who's really doing, who's producing, and who's slacking off. And sometimes, nonchalantly, he'll give a direction to someone in the undercover, he or she, whoever the boss is. And then eventually he gets revealed. Well, Jesus came once, but we could regard him as our undercover boss who is watching us, who is teaching us, who is helping us along the way, who is enlightening us, who is giving us a direction on this sojourn, giving us, giving us an optimistic direction to really living and appreciating the life that he participated in. That's no small accident that God became human being. No small accident that we have the way. Our companion Jesus has shown us the way to the Father. Through one another. Through each other. Weren't our hearts burning within us? And maybe our 
our hearts should burn within us as we hear his word, as we break bread, and as we leave and run to share it with our families, our friends, um, fellow colleagues, with a smile, for optimism. He's with us. He is alive. Our hearts should burn with joy.